framework of the law as we go through this. Does anybody have any pressing questions right now from an IT procurement standpoint that you want to get answered before we leave? Because if there's like a burning question, I want to know so I can give time to that burning question. Nobody's struggling with an IT procurement issue that they need help with right now. Okay, good. So we're going to walk through this, and, and some of this is going to be redundant. I'm not going to read slides to you, but the bottom line is you've got to follow the processes that are laid out in the general statutes. The good news is there's a lot of flexibility from an IT standpoint, and most people, including your procurement agents, don't realize all the flexibility that we have in the IT space. So I got a call from anybody here from health department. I got a call from a, a guy. He's not really a vendor. I don't really know how to describe what he does. Um, he started something called the North Carolina Telehealth Network not too long ago, and it's a federally funded program. Have you guys? Yeah. You got yeah, it. On. Okay, so you probably know Dave Kirby. <coughs> That's what I'm talking about. He was the one that was sort of the salesperson behind it, and and they did an IT RFP to award the contract for that backbone to MCNC, and it's been really interesting because the federal auditors came in and said that they didn't follow their proper procedures. And so our attorneys and their attorney, luckily for them, their attorney is also a senator here in North Carolina, so that's always a plus to have. And so they've been, we've been writing all of these sort of documentation that actually what they did was they put out an IT RFP for a service. Now the state of North Carolina services never have to be competitively bid. So they did not advertise like they were supposed to under the IT RFP requirement. But because it was a service, it's okay. But this is null and void. So How do you this is find service? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. So this is the kind of stuff that when we get into this nuancing, it's going to be, and I've got a slide on that, it's going to be interesting, particularly around things like the cloud, right? I mean, it, it really gets a little bit complicated to define the word service. But if you don't follow the procedures, the contract is null and void. It's only null and void if you get challenged, but it is null and void the minute you get challenged. Has anybody here ever been challenged and had to terminate a contract because they didn't do the procedures properly? It doesn't happen all that often, but I would argue that you will see it happening more and more because competition is tight right now. Okay, so when we think about the law, you're going to go with what we call the most restrictive rule. So if state law says you do not have to competitively bid anything under $30,000, which is what the state law says, but your local policy says you have to bid, Kevin, how many bids, what's the threshold you have? Um, For informal bids? $500. Anything over $500, they have to get three quotes? <laughs> yeah. So state law, 30000 city of Eden policy, $500, which is actually moved up. Yeah, it was 200 to. It was 200 oh, Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. wow. Yeah. That's Feel so my pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that he's putting it out for, for bidding. It means he's going on the internet and getting three quotes from CDWG, Egghead, whatever, right? Yes. New egg. <laughs> it's all the same. <laughs> okay, so as we think through this, I just wanted to give you a definition that's a legal definition of what is actually a contract because this is going to be important. A contract is composed of an offer, an acceptance of that offer, and any considerations that have been written into the contract. So the definition is going to be complicated and just, I, I don't know, I think I took this out. Oh no, I left it in. I was worried that I left, took this out. Is a construction project a contract? No, it doesn't depend on the cost. If you are engaging in construction, you've hired somebody to do construction, even at your own house, is it a contract? Yes. Repairs to your house, would that be a contract? Yes. Right? Let's go back. Remember. An agreement between two or more parties can, uh, creating obligations that are enforceable or otherwise recognized by law. Okay? So let's go here again. Property transaction, sell a property, is that a contract? Services, is that a contract? When you yeah. sign up for AT&T, is that a contract? Yes. Yeah. Credit card purchases, is that a contract? Yes. Yeah. 
good. All of these are contracts. There are lots of ways that we do contracting that isn't like the formal process, but you are setting up an agreement, right? And that's why contracting is so important, and this is not a contracting lecture, but we had a conversation last night, Ray Hillen, and who's a vendor here, and I and somebody from Orange County were talking. We were talking about a, a breach of PCI data. And there's a requirement in the state of North Carolina that if you have a certain type of breach where particular information is, is compromised, that you have to alert the people whose data has been compromised. And the entire conversation came down to state law requires that between the contracting entity and the way that I see the contracting entity is community college, student, parent, whatever, right? The fact that you outsource it to a third party doesn't negate your responsibility to alert them that their data has been compromised unless you write it into the contract that the third party is required to do that. So contracting is going to be really important as we walk through this. By the way, I'm gonna teach you a couple of things and you're gonna to try to game the contracting system and don't do that because it's bad. We'll talk about why that's bad. So we're gonna talk about proper, con or proper procurement methods, but there's other things that are involved in a valid contract. You actually have to have the authority given to you by your governing board, i.e. your manager, in order to enter into a contract. Most of you, probably as department heads, would have that contractual authority. Does anybody here not have contractual authority as a department head? You don't have contractual authority, so it has to go to somebody else. That actually probably protects you better. That's not a bad thing because it gives you some protection. But most likely, your staff do not have contract authority, even if you are the director, right? They don't have the authority to actually sign those contracts. So we have a couple of things, and actually in government we have a pre-audit requirement in our contracts that you don't need to worry about right now, but there's lots of things that we have to have in place for contracting, but we're just gonna focus on procurement. So the rule of the game that we're gonna talk about is how we do procurement, and it is based, sorry, it is based on what kind of contract it is plus the cost determines our method. So it's type of contract, cost equals method. And this is where that service word gets a little tricky. So we're gonna go through this. Purchases. A purchase contract is anything, the way that I think about it is anything I can touch. Right, apparatus, supplies, materials, equipment. In this room, what do you see that would be a purchase? Chairs, projector, laptop, light bulbs, right? Anything that is in here that I can touch would be a purchase. Then there's construction or repair. We are not going to worry about that today because I'm assuming somebody other than you is doing all the contracting for construction and repair. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be involved in the process to make sure you get conduit and cabling, but separate conversation. We also aren't gonna worry about May Brooks Acts because we don't really deal with these, right? These are things that you have to have a certain type of certification required by the state in order to engage in these services. They have a different set of rules that they're gonna play by. So, so far, the only thing I've told you that actually applies to IT is purchasing, right? Purchasing of something. There's only four categories in, in North Carolina state law around procurement. Purchases, construction, mini brooks, and everything else. <laughs> right? And so everything else, particularly service contracts, fall into this really gray space that has no legal definition. Right? So there's going to be some things that we talk about. Y'all are going to instantly go to, oh, I can game the system by doing service contracts for everything. And that's not actually the case. We're going to talk about the balance of, uh, of where the money is being spent. So you heard me say this earlier, but if the contract type is a purchase, anything that is $30,000 or more for construction of that amount, and we're just going to skip construction. We're just going to go with purchases. Anything $30,000 and up to $90,000 has to be informally bid. Okay, and we'll talk about what the requirements are, formal bidding, informal bidding. When you get over $90,000, you have to formally bid it. We're not gonna worry about $500,000. Now remember, we're going with the most restrictive rule. So in Kevin's case, in Eaton, this number changes to $500. But state law is actually $30,000. Does anybody have that threshold themselves? You do? So they don't make you bid anything out that's not, or they, they don't make you do anything, you just select. Correct. $30,000. You can't ever cancel. 
Oh, yeah. So up to $30,000. Anything under $30,000 you can just buy without doing any processing. Well, no, under $30,000 is informal. I'm sorry, I was saying Under $30,000 you're having to do informal? Yeah, $5,000 to $29.99. Okay, so $5,000 In Mecklenburg County, we just get a quote for anything less than thirty k. Okay. One quote or multiple quotes? Multiple. So some of you are multiple, some of you are one. You just buy it. That's state law. That's state law. You just buy it. Right? State law says, I want 15 PCs, I just buy them. Right? Not using any state contracts, not using convenience contracts, none of those things we're going to talk about in a little while. I just get to buy it. Pretty nice. Right? And the reason that we set up local policies is because that is a lot of money in certain jurisdictions. And taxpayers kind of freak out, right? Which means the elected officials kind of react to that. There are very few places that are like Dan's shop where you have that kind of authority. Usually you're at least required to get a quote, three quotes, whatever it is. Some people require much more than that. Some people have thresholds set around formal purchasing where you have to do a formal process as low as $5,000, which is a nightmare at some level. Okay, so as we keep going through this, we already said that this determines construction or procurement process. So informal bidding are purchases within that less than $90,000 range. And it's got these very bare minimums that we have to have in order to make sure that we get lowest cost. Everything I talk about until we talk about something called the ITRFP is around lowest cost. If you're spending up to $30,000, you don't have to go with lowest cost if you live where Dan lives. The rest of us, we would have to get three quotes. And do you have to choose lowest cost? Unless we have very good reason why we're not. Then we have the right justification as why we're not. Yeah. So that, yeah, there's a consideration clause in there that we're going to talk through in just a second. Formal bidding is anything over $90,000, and that has a ton of requirements to it. Who has done a formal bid? Right, you have to put it in the newspaper, advertise it for seven days, sounds right off the top of my head, right? You have to do, how many of you are doing sealed bids for IT projects, for IT purchases? So what does a sealed bid process mean? You have to collect them all, you have to sign them in, you have to make sure they're documented. And you and unveil them all publicly, time, right? right? <laughs> that, yeah. from an IT standpoint, you should never be doing that. Tell you why. Okay, because there's, there's a great tool that we have for IT that nobody else has. It's called the IT RFP exemption. Um, we we did that sealed bid for video arraignment system for our, our courtrooms, okay. but it was an area outside of our expertise. And we really, but the, uh, we let county and finding. We wrote the RFP, but they did the pro whole bidding process, and that was their call to do that. But. Yeah, I mean, if they want to do that, that's fine. We're it takes a long time, and that public unveiling, I'll show you some differences in just a second. I've got some charts to show you some differences. Would that have fall under that exemption? Absolutely. Okay. So when we talk about the IT RFP exemption, the only thing that I've had recently asked, and it might have been during your class, it wasn't by anybody that was an IT professional. I had a call from a local government who wanted to put in a smart metering system, like right, the radio read meters or AMR, and they called and they were trying to say that it was an IT project. And no, the purpose of the project is radio, is, is water metering, right? So if it would have been something that would have been purchasing previously as a, as a supply, like a water meter, the fact that it sends ones and zeros through the air doesn't change the function of it. Whereas video arraignment absolutely is an IT project, right? Even though I say we shouldn't say IT projects, but anyway. Well, what if you have all the meters in the ground already, and you're just doing the rest of the system to put a fixed point antennas and all the point-to-point uh, -point networks? We thought it was a very hard. Stuff. They were replacing all their meters, but we thought it was a very hard argument to make. Um, you would want to look at where the bulk of the money was. Especially if they stick the IT department with doing the whole thing. Yeah, you would be better off than the engineering department that called me asking about that, but they were replacing the meters themselves with like census meters or whatever they were, I can't remember. And they wanted to claim it was an IT RFP option. They also tried to claim it was a service, 
which was not the case. Um, th there were lots of complicating factors. We'll dig into your example in just a second because I want to walk through what the ITRP exemption actually authorizes. Did you have a question? I, I would just, uh, we've got a, a project that's coming up um, that I haven't written the RFP for, but it's, uh, we're, we're basically gutting out our uh, commissioner's uh, room where we do all of our filming. Yep. Uh, part of that process, uh, I had a contractor come in and say, okay, what, what really needs to be done to accomplish mm -hmm. this, uh, to get an idea of what we were looking at, and the, the, all of the lighting needs to be redone, and the camera systems, and so the lighting is not necessarily IT, but that falls under a turnkey project to make sure that it is accomplished that, correctly. <laughs> I think that would be considered construction and repair for the most part. Okay particularly the lighting. So what I would suggest is that anytime you're starting to question those sorts of things, I would separate the contracts or, or the proposals. I would do one construction contract or repair contract, right, around the lighting, okay. and then I would do a separate one around the IT infrastructure. All right. That would probably be, yeah, and the way, that the, the way the courts would look at it is they would say, okay, we're gonna look at how much money is being spent as well as what the function is. Right? So if the bulk of the money is being spent on redesigning the room, putting in a new dais, putting in new lighting, you know, putting in stadium seating, whatever it is, and there's 20% that's IT expenditure, they're going to say it's not an IT contract unless you yeah, separate it out. So about 25% is other, 75% is IT, about 25%. If it's 75% IT, you probably can do the IT RFP. Right, because that's what the courts are going to try to figure out. Okay, so we're going to skip that one because we don't need that. RFP. This is where you have an advantage that is unbelievably useful for your purposes. It's an option that no other department has in your organization. Anytime people talk about RFPing something out, they're not actually RFPing it out. They're either doing informal bidding or formal bidding. Because the only people that have authority to do IT RFPs are IT, right? Not the IT department, but IT projects. Now, you can choose to do it for a service contract, but I didn't say this earlier, service contracts never have to be competitively bid for any reason. Because they fall under that other category. So what's an example of a service contract? Network maintenance. Pulling Network cable. maintenance. Pulling cable. Pulling cable, right? Anything where you're paying somebody to come in and deliver a service to you, is a service contract. What about um, store or server maintenance? Yes. Well, that's a service contract, right? So those things never have to be competitively bid by state law. I'm not saying by local governing policy, I'm saying by state law. Sometimes there's an education process that needs to happen with the procurement professionals because this is a really tiny part of what they have to know. And they might not even realize the IT RFP option exists. And once they see it, they might like it better because it's a little less work for them. Okay, so just real quickly, ignore this one. This is just a quick show. Purchasing, state law, nothing up to $30,000. Informal bidding, 30 to 90. Above 90 is formal bidding process. Service contracts or everything else, nothing is actually required by state law. Is like fiber frame construction considered a service contract? Or Are you owning the asset? If you're owning the asset, you might be contracting out for the service of the installation. Yes. I'd say that's a service contract. But the materials would be... The materials. What's the bulk of the purchase? What costs more? The Their services? How much more? Like 90%. Then it's a service contract. Okay. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So if the installation <coughs> and the services they're providing is 90% of the contract, either you can split it and do a separate contract, which sometimes people do that specifically because they the cost is low enough that it's under the threshold. Yeah, somebody's done that before, right? So they know they don't have to competitively bid out services, so they put the service out as a separate contract, and then they, they do an informal bid process for the cabling itself, right, for the fiber. Like, like that kind of, like even pulling cables as a service, that's not considered what somebody might consider construction, say you were doing a big build out there. No, I don't think that that would be considered true construction. Now, we don't have any case law on that, so you could be the first one. <laughs> we'll see. So let me show you this, because I think this might help us walk through this. But the reason that, that we always want to 
err on the side of less, probably, is because informal bidding is way easier. IT RFPs are actually not too terribly complicated to do. Formal bidding is much more complicated. So you do not have any requirements to advertise that you are going to let a contract when you do informal bidding, up to $30,000. That's why you are, you guys might have that, or like 30,000 to 90,000. That's why when you're doing those policies that anything over X amount of dollars in your jurisdiction, you get three quotes, it's because you don't have to do any advertising. Okay, does anybody have a different process that they use here where they are required to advertise something that's under $90,000? Nobody does. Okay, good. That's, that's always a good thing. If you use the IT RFP option, you are required to advertise for seven days. Right? Which is newspaper and or electronic, whatever normal media you use to advertise. If you are choosing to only do electronic advertising, your board has to have approved that method. Not for each individual case, but just in general for the government. Number of bids, this is always interesting because people always say, okay, so the required number of bids in my jurisdiction is three because that's state law. There is no state law around how many quotes you have to get or bids or proposals, unless you are over $90,000 and not using the IT RFP. Okay? Is, that, am I, is it clear as mud right now? For, for formal bidding, over $90,000. We've got to find a way to get... Oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. no that's for con construction. Okay. Why did I say that? Stop. Never mind. Ignore me. Sealed bids, you don't have a requirement either. There's no specific number except for construction contracts. Brain just completely froze. Um, and the reason is because they're still bids. So you're not going to know, right? And you may get five that you then kick out three, which is perfectly acceptable as well. You are not required to do a public bid opening. And this one is really important because people are screwing this up left and right. When I see them write the IT RFP, uh, I can't remember if I corrected it on the Ash County one or not, but I remember that there was language in one of them I, wrote, uh, I saw recently where they said they were going to do a formal bid opening, but it, they were using the IT RFP exemption. Don't confuse those two. Do not do a formal bid opening of sealed bids when you do the IT RFP. The reason I'm telling you this is because those proposals are not public records until the contract has been awarded. If you do not award a contract, it is never a public record. The minute you do a formal bid opening, the bids become public as soon as you open them. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference? And if you talk to state ITS, they will tell you, because I get calls from vendors all the time that are really mad, because the state of North Carolina will pull up, put out something using the IT RFP exemption, because they have that authority as well, and then they won't let a contract, or they'll be in the process of deciding, and the vendors will want to see that information, and they tell them no. And the reason they tell them no is because it's not required under state law, right? IBM calls me all the time about this because there'll be contracts that they didn't award at all, and IBM wants to see all the proposals, and they can't. I mean, well, they could. They could choose to release them, but you don't have to release them. You right? only have to release them if you issue a contract. You only have to release them. They're only public record after you've awarded a contract. All of them are? All of them are. Let me go back. Um, one of the things, I probably should have, I don't have it on this because this isn't my laptop, but I have an IT RFP that Todd and I worked on in Ash County. Um, I could put it out. I'll, I'll get a copy of it and put it out with the slideshow because I think it would be useful because one of the things that I thought was really well done in that particular RFP, it references the IT RFP general statute, which you want to do. It kind of lays out the rules, and we're going to talk about what those rules are associated with that in just a second. But more importantly, it says, if you are a vendor and you mark everything on this proposal as a trade secret or confidential, we will throw your proposal away and never consider it. That is illegal in the state of North Carolina. Would you say that again, please? Absolutely. It is illegal in the state of North Carolina for a vendor to mark an entire document as a trade secret or confidential. Pricing data is never a trade secret nor confidential. Our general statutes lay out very specific requirements as to what constitutes a trade secret, and it is very hard to meet those requirements. 
it would essentially have to be like the pro the, the actual code that allows the vendor's product to work that gives them a competitive advantage. So you want to put into all of your RFPs when you put them out that you do not allow or do not receive you, you do not review proposals that come in where the entire thing is marked confidential or trade secret. Because what's going to happen is you're going to be required, if you award a contract, to produce those under the public records law. Right? Now, you've accepted their contract or their proposal. They've marked it as a trade secret, which they haven't met the, the requirements or whatever. But you've accepted it with all that language written on it. And now when the public comes and asks for it, and by the public I mean other vendors, and you release it, then they're going to tell you you violated their, their agreement, their confidentiality, their trade secret. The good news is the state of North Carolina's law will be on your side. The bad news is if there is something in there that was a trade secret and you release that, you will be held liable. I have a question. Absolutely. One of the things uh, that I, I do is if I have a big project, uh, especially lately it seems like we've always got projects that kind of are outside, I can get rid of extra kids' videos, mm -hmm. or anything, things like that. Um, I actually had, like recently, I had to redo the sound system in courtroom one, our historical sure. courtroom. I have, I just call better say, hey, can you come out and look at it and give me, a, give me a quote? So they'll come out, some of them will just come out and give me a very one page thing, some of them will come out and give me a real detailed mm -hmm. analysis, and then I take those three quotes and I'm like, okay, yeah, uh, if it's under the 90,000, I don't have to go up to bid, I've got my three quotes, so I can determine Done. which one I can go with. Now here's the things, the lowest, it's, I very seldom go with the lowest because usually I come in and I look at what they're offering, what, how professional they were when they came in, what type of documentation they're giving me, uh, yep. if they set up anything and did some testing and analysis so I can look at it. That's how I determine which. So one you goes. are skating on unbelievably thin ice. Okay, that's what I need to know. And the reason is because the standard of award for informal bids or formal bids is lowest, responsive, responsible, bidder. Versus the standard of award for the IT RFP, which means you have laid out criteria that you are going to judge them by, and one of the things that you might consider is previous work history with you, willingness to give training credits, yada, 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 right? It's, we call it the best value proposition versus lowest cost. Yeah. To be, and I'm trying to think if I've got um, a slide on responsive, responsible bidder. Okay, yeah, I do. So, lowest cost, plus it meets the legal requirements, right, associated with the bid. This is for informal and formal bidding, which could be quotes. It meets your bid specs. So, the challenge there is you haven't really specced anything for them, so you're going to get in some gray yeah. water right there. And then, does the the way that we judge the bidder is do they have the skills, the ability, and the resources to deliver the product? You could not say, I picked, is there any vendors in here right now? Somebody give me a vendor name. <laughs> right? Like I, I was talking about Whitlock Group. Well, Whitlock Group. And then there's Sound Design, right? Two AV companies who both do work all over the state for building chambers and stuff. You could not say, that Whitlock was a non-responsible bidder and choose sound design. If they both came in with this, because they met your specs, and we know that they're skilled and, and have the abilities and the resources to do the job, you could not kick them out and go with somebody that costs more. You would have to choose the lowest cost. Does that make sense? And, and it makes everybody really nervous because they go, well, if it's the lowest cost, then surely there's hidden things in there that I'm not aware of. If you want to go with best value, you need to use the IT RFP. Always. Okay. So let me back up just for a second because I think that that's going to be a really important consideration. If it's informal bidding, you don't have to have board approval. If it's formal bidding, you have to have board approval. If it's IT RFP, you don't have to have board approval, which most people don't realize either, right? IT RFP can be used for $5 million purchases if you want. There is no financial threshold. Zero. Except like our municipality with fifteen thousand contract you have to take for it. You what? You have to take a fifteen thousand dollar contract for it anyway. So. so local policy would mandate yeah. something differently. 
Okay, so here is how we determine lowest responsive, responsible bidder. Doesn't meet the legal requirements, right? Non-discrimination, um, pre-audit, all sorts of other things. Does it conform to the specs? Can you deliver on the contract? So you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to say, okay, Joe Schmo from down the street decided he'd like to start an IT company, but his expertise is grass cutting, right? And he's going to come in as lowest cost, but he wouldn't actually have the ability to perform the contract. He wouldn't have the right skills or resources, so you could reject that one. So the lowest bid is responsive and responsible. You have to accept it. If it's not, then you've got to document it and go to the next lowest price or reject all bids and start over. You always, under any circumstances, have the right to reject all bids. We don't use that enough. Yes? Can you use the IT RFP even when you're not required to? Say yeah, this is absolutely. So, so it's like going to be a $20,000 project, but you need to make sure the specifications are met, you still need to be able to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we probably should use it more than we actually do. Um, so. I said there was minor deviations that you can sort of negotiate when you're doing anything other than the ITRP. The ITRP is going to have other requirements. But if you're using informal or formal bidding, you can waive or not waive certain requirements. If they didn't comply with statutory requirements, can you still select them? No. Mm -hmm. no. So mm -hmm. the answer here is no, you cannot waive that requirement. They have to meet statutory requirements. If there is a minor, clar minor, minor clerical <laughs> error, can you waive? that and accept the proposal? Yes. Maybe. <laughs> the reason it's maybe is because it depends on if it changes the nature of the contract. If they put he instead of the, probably. If they use a word that meant something completely different, probably not. What about miscalculation of dollar amounts? Vendor X fat fingered, and it was supposed to be a $500,000 contract, and they put the decimal in the wrong place, and now it's a $50,000 contract. No. no. It really depends, right? If it's a situation where everybody else comes in at a certain level, and you go, okay, it's clear that this was an error in this one place, but if it was a consistently documented error, you're probably going to have a hard time selecting that. Then you probably wouldn't want to select it anyway because then you're going to get in a situation where they say, oh, you know, we really screwed up, right? Because your legal basis for holding them accountable is going to be this contract. If there's missing information, you cannot waive that. You can't call the vendor back and say, you know, you left out these three things that I really need to be in this proposal. No, you can't do that. If it's missing other information that's not material, like they forgot to put in, I don't know, um, the what? A signatory page that they're authorized um, to make That's a legal requirement. So you couldn't waive that. Right? You would want to waive something like they put three resumes in there and they forgot the fourth person, they put the name at the top and they didn't put you know, something along those lines, something that was extra. So let's say you've got several vendors respond responded to an RFP or something. Are we doing RFPs or are we doing let's formal or informal bidding? Uh, let's, let's do RFP on this one. Okay. okay, so this doesn't apply there. This is only informal formal bidding. If you had, if, if, if let's say it's a um, data center project to replace hardware, okay. do service work on them. Okay, then you find out that vendor X has been, you, you spoke to them, say, two years ago about this, or a year ago, and they keep re-registering with the product vendor to get the credits. You know how they get that discount? Yeah. They yeah. keep doing it and redoing it and redoing it so they keep having this. And now, you, now when the day comes out or you're looking at a different product, you go to Vendor X, continue to re-register with the manufacturer, they're getting a significant discount, which brings their total cost down lower than everybody else that's out there. At what point can you call can you call the manufacturer and say, I want that spread out across I want that to be fair across every every single integrator oh, sure. that's out there? Do you do they have any I mean, do you have any leverage of saying that yeah. you have to do it or, or they don't have to do it? The vendor the manufacturer you don't you don't have any control over because you're not contracting with the manufacturer, contracting with the right. third party bar, right? right. Um, you said RFP, <laughs> and so if that vendor price is the lowest, you don't have to choose them anyway. You're gonna go with best value. If you spec a different if you want a different product, normally you should write it in your specs. 
but well, we want, let's say you wanted this product, you know this is what you want, but because they keep registering, you know, this vendor keeps registering it, but you've had a bad experience with it. Oh, well, then you, you, get to, you get to consider that when you do the ITRP. So let's, let's flip that and say it's now a informal. Nope. Nope. You have to go with the lowest. Yep. You can't get called vendor, you can't do anything. Nope. Do no negotiation. Okay. So in that case, look, and I'm not going to name any names, but the, um, the product supplier is initially from Cisco. <laughs> <laughs> and vendors will register projects with them. Mm -hmm. Would it be any issue if you called Cisco and said, hey, this group's a bunch of knuckleheads, unregister my project? I think the more information you give the manufacturers, particularly Cisco, tends to work really well in that space. I would absolutely, there is nothing wrong with contract contacting the manufacturer at any point. The only thing you can't do is negotiate the vendor contract. That's what I'll say. So my mind with Cisco also. Go to the bank. And, and I do the same thing. Yeah. But if yeah, you change the totally fact that they would not read, they wouldn't do it. Really? I, I had the same experience with Dell, looking at a, a people watching Sam. Mm -hmm. It's safe. I hadn't had any issue with Cisco. They wouldn't. They wouldn't. They wouldn't, they wouldn't offer that same discount to every to all of them. No, they wouldn't offer it to everybody. So basically, I just either got the discount with this company, or I lost the discount and had to pay more. Right. Levels of playing field. Oh, that's well, and is, that's their business right. choice, right? But if you did ITRP, you could choose somebody else anyway because you had a bad experience. I'll work a certain thousand fairway with contacting them. No, you're fine. You're fine to do that. <laughs> I, I had an experience with this recently, and, and the vendor did not want to change the registration because it would make too many people mad if they changed it. Right. So I went out and got. There's nothing wrong playing uh, little poker with them. The thing that I did was, in the way, uh, maybe the reason Cisco agreed to do it is I actually contacted the vendor and explained to them that they were morons and would never do work for me again, and included Cisco in the conversation. Yes, yeah. But you were doing ITRP. Yeah. Well, it, this hadn't even hit oh. that level. So then you just, you're just I mean, it was, it was at the deep. beginning. Yeah, I mean, you have some authority to negotiate. It's just once it gets into that contractual phase, and the <coughs> RFP is part of the contract, right? So it, that's where it gets a little bit gray. We've already talked about this. I'm going to skip that slide. Do you have the authority in this state to require local preference? <laughs> no, we do, but I don't think you have to. What? Oh, I don't know your name. I'm sorry. Pam. Pam. Oh, yeah. I'm just going <laughs> It is illegal in the state of North Carolina to have local preference. It is illegal in the state of North Carolina to have local preference. The one of the policies. Because they're idiots. It's illegal in the state of North Carolina to have local preference. Uh, Mark, we need to edit that video. <laughs> I have a question. What about national preference by USA? It is illegal in the state of North Carolina to have local preference. Um, is there a statute you could have? Yeah, I can put it together for you guys. I, Norma has written a blog posting on this around local preference, so what I'll do is grab that blog posting and put it out. Um, I don't know where we're putting all this landing information for this session, but I've got a couple of things I want to add to it. Okay. So I'll prep it okay. later and right. then put it on a flash drive and That's fine. get it to Good somebody. Enough. Our contract form that we have to Yeah, who was in the class last year that Norma talked to? Because, well, okay, so anybody that's in the Seattle class right now is going to hear this again. It's illegal in the state of North Carolina to have local preference. U.S. preference, I'm not as sure about. If there's a federal mandate for U.S. preference, it may be okay. Um, the reason is you can't, you, you don't have any leverage in this space. You can't create, and actually the governor came out, Governor Purdue came out and was trying to do some local preference stuff that was illegal, right? So it, it cannot be one of your determining factors. But I'll get you the documentation on it. I know, we're working on a project that's a USDA finance or whatever, yeah. and that does require... Federal US. dollars could require something different, right? Because that's federal a federal pass-through. They have different requirements. They don't actually even play by some of these rules. I don't. 
certain federal projects have to be competitively bid always. Right? So your threshold in the state doesn't actually apply. So you definitely want to pay attention to this. Um, this is actually from my husband, but I'm going to skip this. We were talking about all the things that IT is involved in here. Because we want to show you that the IT RFP for goods and services can be used at any time for any amount for any reason for the duration of your life. What is IT? You might know. Here's <laughs> a little bit better definition of that. Well, batteries will do too. Yeah. Yeah. So here, you want to cite in the RFP process that you're using General Statute 120 or 143-129.8. I say this in my sleep all the time. Boy, this is exactly what I was supposed to send you. Right? This is the language. This is 143-129.8. It gives you some flexibility. The way it gives you flexibility is it lets you, number one, decide what is included in IT. Now, look how expansive this list is. Almost anything you can conceive of that you do in your job is IT. Which, yeah, like electronic data processing, telecommunications, security systems, microprocessors. This is state law telling us what IT is. So when Dan asked that question. That's why I kind of hesitated. Because if you're talking about adding a device to the top of a radio read meter so that it can be used for radio read purposes, I think you could make an argument that that would be electronic data processing. Right? I think that you could make that argument. Where you could make that argument is if it was the, the meters being bought. Do y'all see the difference there? So it just it gets a little bit gray, but the more you use this, the happier you're going to be, the happier procurement agents are going to be. Um, so what do we have to do? We have to have a formal advertisement, seven days, newspaper electronic. We have to evaluate proposals based on RFP criteria. RFP criteria have to be laid out in the RFP. You have to tell them how you're going to judge their proposal, and you have to judge it based on that. Cost can be a consideration, but it does not need to be the only consideration. Vendor history can be part of that. Previous established relationship, meeting the specs would obviously be part of that. But you can list, giving us training credit, whatever it is, you can put anything you want in these specs as long as you measure them against the specs. And then you have the best overall proposal as the standard of award. This is the only time in the state of North Carolina procurement laws that you will see you don't have to go with lowest response and responsible bidder. You have complete flexibility is why we want that. We may negotiate with any proposer within the scope of the RFP. You can't negotiate anything under informal and formal bidding. Right? Only minor deviations once they've given you the quote. Not changing prices, not changing scope. Here, you, as long as you've spec it out in the scope of the RFP, you can say it would be advantageous for, uh, for us to have a conversation about Pricing, right? You're not going to tell them other people's pricing, but you can start negotiating those things. Can't give them a priori knowledge of what their competitors have offered. Because remember, these bill, these are not public until you award a contract. Governing board does not have to be put in place. Uh, governing board approval, unless you're Holly Springs, anything over fifteen thousand dollars has to be approved, right? But it's the expenditure that's approved, or is it the contract? Okay. So oh, I'm sorry. I'm sure that. Did you say? You, well, I'm sorry. When you said you need to negotiate any proposal, pricing thing, just as long as you're not talking about other people's pricing. So, I think the way that I would do it is say, you know, we really would like to go with your proposal. There are some limitations to your proposal. We would like. I, it's almost like you want to say best and final offer. Right. right. But I would hesitate to call it that. But I would try to work with them within the scope of the proposal. And can you say something like it's not following in our budget? Well, the problem is they already know your budgets for the most part, right? They've seen your line item budget from the budget cycle. So I would thought so too, but you'd be surprised at least well, one that we did. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't look. Look. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean I think you could probably have that conversation. Just only on the IT RFP. Right. Negotiating solely on price is gonna be dicey because it looks like price fixing, and that's where you want to be really careful. When you have one respondent that you have a preference for because they met the criteria. 
Yeah. And, and we want to go back to that requirement and say, for instance, you need to provide a phased approach to what you're proposing. Absolutely. So, and you go back just to that one vendor? Doesn't matter. You can negotiate with any proposal within the scope of the RFP. What about, um, does the have a conversation before you have an like, say you want to do this project, you're not exactly sure, you think you might fall under the 90, but after doing a demo or a I'll call that doing your memoir. Okay. Right, I mean, I think that's okay. What I would, what I would suggest that you not do is have the vendor write your proposal for you. shaking your heads like, duh, because I know some of y'all done that, <laughs> right? I mean, I've seen it, because these vendors give you checklists that are proposed <clears throat> checklists, and when you start getting into that space, you will get some challenges. I don't care if you followed every letter of the law. It looks like you picked HTE because HTE gave you their worksheet, right? You just, you really need to be careful with that. So make sure you're writing your own or finding somebody else's or, Big borrowing and stealing. What about specific products? Say you wanted a Ford F-150 truck. Oh, you're asking yeah. about um, sole sourcing. I mean, can you say that if you, if, you know, if a Chevy truck is the equivalent truck, you can buy it, but our garage certified on like Ford? Yes. If you are a Cisco shop, you can spec Cisco equipment. So it's not they send it out and say that. You cannot sole source Cisco equipment. There is a difference. And we screw this up all the time, and, and it's perfect timing because we're going to go right into this conversation around sole sourcing. Special circumstances that are exemptions to the competitive bidding process. Sole sourcing. Everybody screws this up. Everybody. You cannot sole source a Ford. You can spec it in your RFP process. You cannot sole source Cisco. Why? Because Cisco actually doesn't even sell to you guys. They sell through bars. Right? So you have multiple suppliers of Cisco. One manufacturer, multiple suppliers. So you can't sole source Cisco. Where I have seen sole source work is that there's an overriding compatibility concern, and it's not Cisco, because things work with Cisco other than Cisco. Right? We know this. But like Motorola radio systems, when you get into that kind of radio space, that stuff is not interoperable. And so if it is not interoperable, you can sole source. If you want to get, and Motorola sells direct. Motorola sells Motorola, right? There's not bars for Motorola. There's integrators. There's a, well, like we bought, there's, there's, a, there's a company here locally that is the only regional seller of Motorola. Okay. You can't buy it from anybody else. Mm -hmm. So we sole source. Mm -hmm. that. That's fine. Okay. Absolutely fine. So in those cases, that would be fine. So sole source applies to anything that you're buying. Competition is not available as sort of one of the overriding concerns or standardization and compatibility. You're not going to be able to say I'm sole sourcing on Lenovo because that doesn't, a, a computer is a computer, right? You can spec a preference in your RFP process we want Lenovo, right? But Lenovo has multiple manufacturers because I can go to Best Buy and Apple, I used to use an example, but now you can buy Apple everywhere, right? Unless you're in education. Education, you guys have to buy Apple through Apple, right? So you can sole source. Because you can't buy it at Best Buy or at the AT&T store or whatever it is. So just to clarify, you can set, yes. You can put in your specs any requirements that you have. Cisco, right? You absolutely can put that in your specs. Somebody can, can D-Link still, still can respond to the They can still submit to it, absolutely. And they can say, we aren't that, but we are equally as good. And then you have your evaluation criteria. And as long as you stick to your evaluation criteria, you're good. Document your evaluation criteria. Document how you're rating them, because they're going to ask for that. Wake County does this, and I think it is brilliant. They take their, their proposals, they score them, they have multiple people working on their projects, they score them, and they put them on the internet for the vendors to see. That's brilliant. Love that. Andy. Is the customer the person making the purchase? Because with Apple, um, our, our school system is receiving some funding from, from the county government, and part of the stipulation of that funding is that we do the procurement. We do the actual purchase. But some vendors say that the customer, well, like. I, I 
don't know that you can get the ed discount. That, that's right. We don't get the discount, but the pricing we're getting is better than what the schools are getting. Really? Yes. And so, so we were making rare. the purchases, and, and our expert. reseller told us, well, now, now, I can sell these to you, but but I can't sell them to a school. Yeah. So the county's making the purchase, but they're being delivered to a school. <coughs> and the, and the same you better hope you don't get audited by Apple. Because another, I think that's a breach of contract. And another vendor said that it has to do with the delivery address. The delivery address represents the real customer, not who's paying for it. Uh -huh. I buy flowers for my mom. Don't trust vendors. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not being mean, but their, their job is to make a sale, right? You need your attorneys looking at that. You, To me, the customer is the owner, user, right? Possession is nine-tenths of the law. So I would be really wary of that, personally. Because you have violated Apple's terms and conditions for Apple for Ed, in my opinion. As long as you don't get sued, you should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so when is this going to be on the uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we probably won't see very many emergencies. But emergencies, your, um, your server going down is probably not going to be an emergency, unless it's your 911 server or your CAD server. Or something like that. That would be a sole store, or an exemption where you just get to go out and buy it, right? Think about getting hit with tornado, those kinds of sort of massive issues. That would be where you may be able to use emergency purchases, but you won't see this very often. Yeah, yeah, that one is pretty important, right? Like it involves your ability to do your job. We're not worried about these next two. You can always buy off of state and federal contracts. Here's the kicker. You've got to be buying the same item from the same vendor that's on the state and federal contract, right? You can negotiate with these vendors on price. State negotiate. Your starting point. Negotiate, absolutely. Kevin said state pricing should be your starting point, not your end point. Always negotiate with them. You don't have to get any approvals for doing this. Piggybacking. People screw this up all the time. Here are the rules for piggybacking. It has to be a competitively bid contract within the last 12 months. I don't mean an extension of a contract. I mean a competitively bid contract within the last 12 months. The original signatory date is within the last 12 months. You can piggyback off of that. Same item, same vendor, negotiate price. Only in the formal purchasing range. Right? So we use this and you have to do, uh, you have to have board approval with some level of public notice that you're going to do that piggybacking. A lot of people want to say they're going to piggyback, and I get this call, I got this call from somebody in uh, Durham Public Schools. She's here right now. But she, was, she called me up and she was using the word piggybacking when she meant, oh, not this one, convenience contracting, group purchasing. Two very different concepts. Piggybacking within 12 months, convenience contract or group purchasing agreement like the Cisco agreement that we have here for Nickel Giza. That applies for the duration of the contract. Dan. Piggyback. So say someone else in North Carolina bought an ERP system from uh -huh. someone recently, and I want to buy the same ERP system from that same vendor. And I just say, hey, I'm buying. It's the same thing. It's, it's the software. It's the services we implement. I just uh -huh. negotiate my own price with that vendor for the same kind of deal. Formal purchases, so the amounts over... Threshold, right? Now you're not going to do you're not going to do an, an ITRP, right? You're choosing not to do that. Same item, same vendor, same <coughs> or favorable prices, terms, and conditions. Had to do within the last 12 months. You do have to do public notice and board approval. Oh my God, that would save so much money. Yeah, it's the reason it's really hard to do this and things like ERP is they typically cannot give you the same or better pricing. Because they'll come in and you're, you're, when I say same or better pricing, I don't mean per unit, I mean total contract price. So the scalability of the contract is always an issue. Now if it was Mecklenburg County that bought it and you're on WASA and you want to buy it, yeah, you may win. Oh, Mecklenburg wow. County is never going to find an ERP that is more expensive than what theirs was, at least not in our state. And you can go outside the state, by the way. How does that work outside the state? Like, so you know, you have, if there's a contract you're piggybacking on and the, the other state has a different general statute for like a $100,000 purchasing where our competitive 
It has to be competitively bid. Right? That's the kicker. It has to be competitively bid. Did you say you can go outside? Yeah, so you'll see this um, sometimes. But if you're going to go outside the state, I would still look at group purchasing agreements because they're the better deal. PEPM, um, WISCA, which is the Western States Computing Alliance. There's one out of Charlotte now that I can't remember. CAP? <coughs> Char Charlotte Area Purchasing or something? Charlotte Purchasing Yeah, CPA, whatever they call it. Charlotte Area Purchasing Alliance, um, the Nickel Giza. We're trying to do more with Nickel Giza convenience contracts. As long as it's done competitively, we have discounts, and there are two or more agencies that are interested in buying from this, right? Which is what we did with the Jacksonville convenience contract for Cisco. You just run it through that. That we, when I teach vendors this class, they're like, "Why don't we use this more?" And I'm like, "I don't know. Why don't we use this more?" It's incumbent on them to have these conversations as well, in my opinion, because this is huge. You get out of every single requirement. And the state of North Carolina is actually, uh, state agencies have not had this authority up to now, but there is a bill, I don't know if it may cross over or not, I haven't looked at the list of crossover bills, to allow state agencies to buy off of group purchasing programs. Mostly because Rick Owens likes to rabble rouse and created some stink about the Cisco contract with the state. Because our pricing is way better than what the state was getting. You have the ability to use too. Yeah, so I mean it makes sense, right? Because at the end of the day it should be about cheapest, cost for the taxpayer for the same service, right? You should be paying a premium. Okay, uh, we're going to skip these items. I think we're running right out of time. There's an awesome resource we have at School of Government. It's ncpurchasing.unc.edu. I'll put up a link to this as well. Um, so the things that I think I've said to you guys is I'm going to have oh, this link, the IT RFP for Ashe County, the language around local preference, which may just be the blog posting link as well. Is there anything else I promised you? Because you know I'm going to forget when I leave here. Who's going to nag me? Before you get to nag me? <laughs> Evan, you going to nag me? Statute for um, local, local preference. preference. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a blog posting that, that uh, Norma references, but I'll find it for you. So we do have this resource, and there's some really cool tools on here that help you kind of walk through. So a lot of the slides you saw, they're actually already charts that we've put out on this site. Great charts for conflicts of interest. We didn't cover that today. Give some papers law. You all broke them. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I eat protein bars in my room. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, so there are some things. Federal laws are very different, so don't don't think that federal laws uh, are the same. But this is a useful resource. And anytime you have procurement questions. We have wonderful IT, uh, wonderful attorneys that do this kind of work. So if you send the questions to me, I will get them to the right attorney if I don't know the answer. They're really good at that stuff. Other questions for me before we take a break? Just a quickie. Sure. Um, we outsourced the mainframe five years ago. There's only one application left. Our five-year contract expires in February. We do not want to have to go back out to bid. We're very happy with the vendor. We've got thousands of tapes there. How do we stay with that vendor for the two years it's still going to take to move the Is that service? Yes. You stay with the vendor. It's no competitive bidding process for services. Are there any dollar thresholds that apply nope. to the statement? Nope. Services never have to be competitively bid. So, so it's just maybe another it's like Cisco SmartNet? Never has to be competitively bid. Let me go back here. Look. Never has to be competitively bid because remember everything else was services. So if it's a service contract, you just sign the service contract again. Unless the local organization. Unless your local <laughs> ordinance requires you to do something differently. Yeah, why would they want to do that? If they do require something differently, talk to them so you can get an exemption for it. Because they're not legally required under law to do that, so maybe they'll exempt it because business case is compelling that it's going to be only two years.